our study today is entitled, What Must I Do to Be Saved? And of course, you will recognize that that is taken from a New Testament Bible story in Acts chapter 16. And I want to read that story for you, or at least most of it. Acts 16 verse 23 is where I want to start. It says, And when they had laid many stripes upon them, them would be Paul and Silas, if you remember that story. They cast them, Paul and Silas, into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Verse 24, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Verse 25, and at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. What a testimony, amen? What a testimony was going on there. Verse 26, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. That's a miracle of God. Verse 27, And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had all been fled. And, you know, in that type of situation, he has the charge of keeping these prisoners, and if he doesn't do what he's supposed to do, what, what do you think might happen? Yeah. He loses his life, and so he figures it's better to take my own life on my terms than to do, get it the way they're going to give it to me. Yeah. You know, maybe torture and death. Well, verse 28 says, But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, because we are all here. That's pretty amazing. All we know about is two Christians in the prison. But their influence, maybe the angel's influence, kept all of these bad people, maybe, from running away. They were all there, is what Paul said. And in verse 29, he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. I think he understood why the people were still there. Mm -hmm. He knew this had to have been a miracle, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Kind of like the centurion when Christ died on the cross. You know, the most least likely person was the one that understood what was going on at the crucifixion, wasn't it? And I think that's a little bit the way it was here, that this least likely maybe person really understood what was happening. He knew that it was not just an earthquake. It was a miracle from God. So he trembles and he falls down before Paul and Silas. And now look, verse 30, it says, And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So that's our title. I've been confronted with a lot of seeming controversy over the plan of salvation lately. And of course, that sets my mind into action, and that makes this a topic that I think is important, that I think we would do well here at home to cover and cover again. Amen? Amen. We often talk about the fact, yes, we do spend a lot of time going over the same things in church, don't we? But 
The old saying is, practice makes perfect. Amen? If we were going to be great pianists or great guitarists, we'd have to practice. We'd have to do the same thing over and over. So how many of you know that being a great Christian requires doing the same things over and over? Amen? The devil wants us, you and me, to misunderstand the Bible and the plan of salvation. And he basically works like this. He wants you to go too far in one direction or the other. Robin knew exactly what I was talking about. <laughs> She's been listening to me a long time. The devil wants you to go too far, people, in one direction or the other. Now, this is just a picture that I found from somebody's presentation that they did online, but I thought it was a nice picture, and so I thought I would share it with you. Notice the narrow road and the two ditches. That's pretty good stuff. That's pretty good stuff. But look at the subtitle. What to avoid as you follow Jesus. Right? Are there things to avoid? Sure there are. So it's, it's a really good picture that I found on the internet that I think illustrates this point very well. Jesus said the road to life is narrow. That's right. And the road to destruction is wide. Broad. And many a preacher has added the idea of the two ditches on either side of the road. We're supposed to be on a road because we're supposed to be going somewhere. Amen? Amen. And when you are going somewhere, the last place you want to be is in the ditch on the side of the road. And it really doesn't matter to you whether you're avoiding the right ditch or whether you're avoiding the left ditch. That we have in common with Satan. He doesn't care which one we fall into. Could care less. I could care less which one I'm avoiding. Let's stay out of the ditches on either side of the road. Amen? Amen? The devil doesn't care what ditch you are in. He doesn't care whether you go too far this way, whether you go too far that way. But believe me when I say this, that he loves it when you go too far and land in the ditch. That's like his favorite thing. Absolutely. And this is exactly what he tries to do and to make us do with our doctrines. With our doctrines. The next verse I want to share with you is Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's the glory of God again. When I see the word glory, what do I think about? Character. It just automatically happens. I've trained the mind. When I see the word character, bing, 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 bing. Hey, there's something to do with the glory here. Let's think about it. All have sinned, and so they have come short of the glory of God. The first thing I think that needs to be considered is the sin problem. Right? What is our problem? Sin. It is sin. Now, there's a lot of different concepts out there. But if there's a problem in our midst... I want to go with the solution that gets rid of the problem. 
some of the solutions in some of the churches are to placate the problem. The problem can stay, we just find a way to work around it. No, that's not what the Bible does, that's not what Jesus does. When Jesus fixes something, <laughs> I remember somebody saying, it be fixed. <laughs> Amen? When Jesus does something, He does it right. All have sinned and come short of the character, the glory of God. And that's a very, very important part of this whole study here today. You know, a long time ago, I don't even know how long ago, but I have had a website since the late 80s, okay? And a long time ago, I found what they call a GIF, G-I-F. It's an animated clip art kind of thing on the computer. I found this a long time ago. I don't even know how long ago, but I've had it on my web page since almost the very beginning. And it looks like this. And it's animated, so it changes. And you notice, it says, God and man are together. Sin causes a gap. Sin separates God and man. Jesus comes and bridges the gap. So what do you have now? God and man together again, right? Like it was in the very beginning. And the other day, I was reading in the Spirit of Prophecy, and I found this little statement. And little statements are my favorite ones. I really do. I think it's, it's really profound. The more you can say in the less words is a gift to me. But look at this. One selected message is 363 says, Through Christ, restoration as well as reconciliation is provided for man. Now, understand, reconciliation is good. We want that. But if that's all you have, then that's just a workaround to the sin problem. Alright? Look at this. Through Christ, restoration. That means fixing the problem. Putting it back like it was to begin with. Through Christ, restoration as well as reconciliation is provided for man. Now look, the gulf that was made by sin has been spanned by the cross. Amen? Amen? I don't know who made that little thing that I just showed you, but they were right. Amen? They were right. So, we just read Romans 3.23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I don't want to fail to mention the glory of God here. We're told that the glory, the bright light that is the presence of God, also represents His character. And as we are looking at the gospel in Romans here, we need to understand that man was created in the image of the Father and the Son. Isn't that right? The Father said to His Son, Let us make man in our image. And it was this glorious character that was the very first thing lost when Adam and Eve fell. The character being created in the image, the character of God was the very first thing that was lost. It was not only the first thing that they lost, but it was, in my estimation, the worst thing 
that they lost. Worse, much worse than losing their paradise home. And even worse than losing access to the tree of life, which was the way God provided eternal life to them. By far the worst loss sustained in the fall of mankind was losing the glorious image of God. Therefore, what is the greatest thing to be gained or regained, if you will, in the plan of salvation? Listen, brothers and sisters, it's not paradise. As wonderful as heaven is going to be, that's not the point. It's not paradise. It's not even eternal life. The greatest thing to be gained in the plan of salvation is to have the image of God restored in us. That's number one. Number one. So, let's move on. Romans 3, 24 now says, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We have all sinned and come short of the glory or character of God, and therefore there is this gulf that has been made between God and man. And it's the blood of Jesus shed on the cross of Calvary that comes and bridges or spans that gulf, that gap. And this the Bible calls justification by faith. Now please pay attention. We Adventists did not come up with this term, justification by faith. It was the Apostle Paul who gave us this term. And there's another important term that we are given in this chapter here, and we're going to look at that in just a moment. But please don't miss this point. It is justification that bridges the gap that was made by sin. And it's Jesus that has made this possible by His sacrifice on the cross. And one more time, this is called justification by faith. Because this same Apostle Paul also teaches us in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9, he says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen? Amen. Alright, back to Romans chapter 3. Now I want to back up and show you another term in that chapter. You have to go back a few verses. Romans 3, verse 22, it says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith. Does it say in Jesus? No. Aha! Again it says, of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So, we have two very important terms used here in this chapter and especially so for Seventh-day Adventists. Justification by faith and righteousness by faith. Amen? Amen? We didn't invent these terms. We might think that we did as Adventists because we really uh, use them a lot. We did not invent these terms, and folks, therefore, we cannot define these terms. The Apostle Paul did, so where do we need to go to find out what they mean? 
obviously to the Bible. We must let the Bible interpret itself. And if we will remember that precious fact, we will learn some things here. By the way, there is a couple of more terms that go along with this righteousness by faith message, but they don't occur in this chapter. In fact, they come a little bit later in Paul's writings, and that is just how they should be handled in our teaching here. We're going to put them on the back burner, and we'll talk about them in just a few minutes. But we talk a lot, as Adventists, we talk a lot about righteousness by faith, as well we should. That's the plan of salvation in a nutshell, isn't it? And it all begins with justification by faith. What does that mean, justification by faith? It sounds like a big old theological term, but it is so neat sometimes how that big words are really very simple. It happens a few times in the Bible. I don't know how, because the language has changed upteen times to get us to English, hasn't it? The craziest language in the history of the world is American English. But we have this word in the Bible, atonement. And somebody says, what does that mean? At one meant. Isn't that awesome? Justification by faith. We've learned a simple definition for the word justified. Just as if I'd never sinned. Isn't that wonderful? I sure think it is. Remember, Jesus bridges the gap. And He does this even before we are born. He makes all of this possible. So at the very moment that we become sinners, this plan is already in place so that we are not eternally lost. Amen. I don't have it to put on the screen. We're not going to talk about it. But just for your information, Romans chapter 5. What I just said is what Romans chapter 5 is all about. It's what it's talking about. There was a probation, another probation provided for us by the plan of salvation before we were ever born, before we ever became sinners in the first place. Praise the Lord. Amen. The Bible says plainly that the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23. The other half of that verse is on your bulletin today. And therefore, that's the only thing that we deserve. Death. That's right. But God's plan of salvation gives us another probation to give us time to learn, to accept or reject the plan. He gives us another time of probation, a time for learning what we need to learn. And accept what we need to accept. And yes, eventually even do the things that we need to do. Right? We're not saved by the doing. But, according to the Bible, we have lots of doing to do. So, we are learning about righteousness by faith. Right? That's our study. That's Romans chapter 3. And the first part of that is called justification by faith. And we need to know something else about this justification by faith that is found in verse 25. Romans 3.25 says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. It's all about the blood. To declare... His righteousness, righteousness by faith, right? For the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance 
of God. Now, verse 24, just so there's no mistake, verse 24 said, being justified freely by His grace. Right? It's justification that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So we're dealing with the subject of justification by faith, and it continues here and says, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation, Jesus, through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins, period, period, is there a period there? No. It goes on. It says, for the remission of sins that are past. That's talking about the tense. Past Amen. tense. Through the forbearance of God. Brothers and sisters, the Bible plainly says here that justification is for the sins that are past. And I want you to think about that. Sins that are past are not sins of the present. Right or wrong? They are certainly not sins that are future. Isn't that right? So, justification by faith is where Jesus steps in and by His great sacrifice, He bridges that gap between God and man. Amen. But please be very careful to always remember that when you're talking justification, you're talking about sins that are past sins only. Baptist theology says that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was for sins past, present, and future. <laughs> That's kind of what our denomination has come to believe. We're accepting all of this stuff. But if you believe that Baptist theology about sins that are past, present, and future. That, it, brothers and sisters, is what they call once saved, always saved. And that is not what the Bible teaches. That is not what the Apostle Paul teaches us. Verse 26 says, To declare, I say, at this time, His righteousness righteousness by faith, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. It says just. And folks, that's short for justification. It also says that Jesus is the justifier. And the just one, the justifier, is doing what? He's justifying. That's justification again. Amen? Amen? And now I want you to notice those last words. It says, of him which believeth in Jesus. Remember the story that we started with today. We left off with this Bible verse. Acts 16 verse 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's a question. He asked the question of the, of the apostles and that demands an answer, doesn't it? Yes. The very next verse has that answer. Verse 31 says, They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. You know, it's said several times in the Bible. In one Bible verse, Mark 5, verse 36, it actually says, only believe. And I thank God for this Bible verse. And there's a couple of reasons why. For one thing, and I'm talking about this Bible verse on the screen, 
For one thing, it says, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. But it doesn't just say that the man would be saved. It says that his household would be saved too. Now, that's not just an indiscriminate promise there. Because we know that every person has a free will. And every person gets to make their own decision. I'm waiting on my children to make the right decision and come back to the Lord. Some of you are the same way, amen? But folks, I don't get to make that decision. And neither does God. He does allow us to make our own decisions. Every person has a free will and every person gets to make their own decision whether to accept or reject God's plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. But I have often heard people say we are not saved in families or groups or churches. We are saved as individuals. And folks, that is a true statement. It is a true statement. But please listen to me. I can show you many, so many Bible verses that show us the fact that God absolutely did intend to save us as families. Amen. He did intend to save us as churches. Amen. He even intended to save us as nations. Obviously, we see that in the nation of Israel. But the whole point was that Israel was supposed to be the light of the world, the light to the Gentiles. So he wanted that nation to save other nations. Now, the flip side to this statement that I've just made is found in the hardness of our hearts. God intended that every last one of us was to be saved. Yep, that means your whole family. Every last one of us. And yes, that means our whole church. Every single one of us. And yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, that means the whole nation of Israel and the whole nation of America. Amen. And again, but for the hardness of our hearts, that is exactly how it would be. That's God's will. Years and years ago, we were given a set of videos that were made in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, put out by Baptists. They were moody science videos. Do you remember those things? Your parents bought my children a set of those videos featuring Dr. Irwin A. Moon, a Baptist. He made an illustration, though, in that video that has stuck with me through the years. He said, I am an intelligent man. Now, I put the picture up there because I don't want to move the camera and do the illustration for you up here. But, he had a chair, pretty much exactly like this one, from his office. He says, I'm an intelligent man. I can look at this chair and I can see that it is well made. Quite a strong chair, he said. In fact, he said, I have sat in these chairs for years now. I know that this is a chair that will hold me up. But in spite of all this, it would be impossible for me he said, to say, I believe in this chair, 
the way that the Bible says that we're supposed to believe in God the Father and Jesus. It would be impossible for me to say that I believe in this chair the way the Bible is saying to believe in Jesus while I am standing beside the chair. It can't be done. That's not what the Bible is talking about when it says to only believe. He said, the only way that I can say that I believe in this chair in the Bible way is to be sitting in the chair. Amen? Yes, the King James Version says believe. And once it even says only believe. But the Bible kind of believing is based on our putting our weight on God. Putting our trust in the Father and the Son. Does that make sense to everyone? I think it's a wonderful, wonderful illustration. Back to Romans 3, verse 28, it says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Verse 29, it says, Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles Yes, of the Gentiles also. That's something else we ought to be thanking the Lord for because I think most of us are Gentiles. Verse 30, Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision, that just means Jews, by faith, justify the Jews by faith, and the uncircumcision or the Gentiles through faith. Verse 31, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. And we read a couple of other Bible verses that say virtually the same thing in our Sabbath school class this morning, didn't we? All right. Praise the Lord for that. We don't throw out the law because we're not saved by the law. Right? Now, this brings us to another of those Bible theology terms from the Apostle Paul. After justification by faith, there is another part to the righteousness by faith message. And for that, I want to take you to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3. It says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. What is sanctification? Well, a good biblical definition for sanctification would be to cleanse something, to purify something, even to set something apart and to make it holy. And of course we understand that only God can make something holy, right? Doesn't matter whether it's a day, a place, or a person, only God can make someone holy or something holy. Another Bible verse is 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 13. It says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Jesus said in his great prayer in John 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And Paul is following that same formula here when he says, Through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. And just one more to confirm this from a different author, this time 1 Peter 1, verse 2, it says, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the 
spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Amen. Well, now I want to show you some other terms that we're going to associate with this. But righteousness by faith is made up basically of two things. Justification by faith and sanctification by faith. You know, eventually we, we would get to glorification by faith, right? But there's some other terms I want to show you. Romans chapter 4, verse 6, Even as David also describes the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. The Bible tells us that Abraham obeyed God and he counted it to him for righteousness. In another place it says imputeth righteousness without works. And then another good one is Romans 4 verse 22. It says, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Part of the righteousness by faith message is that righteousness is to be imputed unto us. But there's one more term I want to show you. And I've got the neatest verse for this one because everybody will just be able to see it so very plainly. Luke 3, verse 11, He answereth and said unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. The word we're looking for here is impart. One word is impute. The other word is impart. And we're going to, we're going to talk more about them. But he imputes, he counts it as righteousness. That's what impute means. In Luke 3, what does the word impart mean? To give it. If he asks you for your coat, you give him the coat. You impart to him the coat. All right, now I want to share to you, share with you, just a couple of statements here before we close. Ellen White says in the Review and Herald, she says, Righteousness within is testified to by righteousness without. Mm. He who is righteous within is not hard-hearted and unsympathetic, but day by day he grows into the image of Christ. Amen. Now that's amazing. One way you look at that word image, we would say, what is an image? That's a picture, right? Mm -hmm. So she's telling us that day by day, we are supposed to grow into a picture, picture of Jesus. I like that, don't you? Yes. I like that. Yes. But I also want to remember you that at the creation, the Father said to the Son, let us make man in our image. Could that be what she's talking about here? Absolutely. In other words, not just a physical picture, but a mental picture and a spiritual picture. The whole man, as we read a little while ago. Day by day, we are supposed to grow into the image physically, mentally, and spiritually. And that would include the character, wouldn't it? The image of Christ. Going on, she says, from strength to strength. He who is being sanctified by the truth will be self-controlled and will follow in the footsteps of Christ until grace is lost in glory. Isn't that beautiful language? The grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. We sang it today. 
that saved a wretch like me? What would it mean that the grace is lost in the glory? It is character. It is the fact that what started out as forgiving me only winds up being giving me, not forgiving. First you forget, first God forgives, then He gives. And it has deep, deep meaning until the grace is lost in the glory. The word glory is the character. Right? What started out as just forgiving us of our sins becomes the fact that He is building in us a character like His own. Amen. Praise His holy name. Look at this. The righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. The righteousness by which we are sanctified is imparted. There's those words. The first, she says, is our title to heaven. The second, sanctification, is our fitness for heaven. The word impute literally means to charge. When we were out in California, I asked a question. Do you ladies know about that? What that means? That joke did not go over well. I didn't get, I didn't get snigger. The men were afraid to laugh at that joke. But you understand, I'm really serious about it. To charge, to attribute to the account of. When we go to the store and we charge something, what are we doing? We're putting it on the account. It's perfect language for us to understand the plan of salvation. It really is. The word imputed simply says charge to the account of. Alright, the word impart means to divide like if you were cutting up a pie. To give, to grant, or to communicate, to bestow on. And imparted simply says communicated, granted, or conferred. All right? So, there's two kinds of righteousness by faith. And they go hand in hand. Actually, they are to coexist all the time. And yes, justification makes the way for sanctification possible. Right? It always comes first. And therefore, in a certain sense, it is the most important. No doubt about it. Sanctification is a part of the process. But justification is never to leave us. Remember the sanctuary? We're supposed to take things to the sanctuary, aren't we? Well, listen to this. At the very end of the sanctuary service on the Day of Atonement, the last thing is the Day of Atonement, right? At least until you get to the Feast of the Tabernacles. But that's the end of the ceremonial service in the tabernacle. And they select two goats, they cast lots upon the goats. One is the Lord's goat. The other is the scapegoat, which is the devil's goat. It's not the ill-accused innocent one, like we've made that word to mean now. But the very last thing that happens on the Day of Atonement is the Lord's goat is sacrificed. Just one more of those to remind us of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, right? Amen. Trust me, justification never, never, never leaves us. It's to be a part of the process 
always. Please hear me when I say that justification is by faith. And sanctification is by faith. No difference there. Justification by faith. Sanctification by faith. The two of them together is what Paul's talking about when he says righteousness by faith. And like an old song I remember, you can't have one without the other. Right? Now, unless you're the thief on the cross. Because then you can just have justification. It works perfectly. Was it enough to save the thief on the cross? Yes, absolutely it was. But unless we have that kind of experience... You cannot have justification without sanctification. You cannot have sanctification without justification. They're both supposed to be this process, this plan of God's salvation in us. Amen? Amen. And both of them are by faith. Just a few more slides. Bear with me. Christ has provided means whereby our whole life may be an unbroken communion with Himself. Mm -hmm. But the sense of Christ's abiding presence can only come through living faith. Mm -hmm. There must be a personal consecration to Him. Mm -hmm. He must be a personal Savior. Mm -hmm. Self must be hid with Christ in God then the grace received will be constantly imparted as a grateful offering to God. In this union, Christ identifies himself with man before God and the heavenly universe. Amen. Look at this one. But as many as received them, to them gave he power. Let me redo that. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Our sins are reckoned to Christ. Reckon is another accounting firm. Justified is an accounting term. It's charged to us. It's given to us, if you will. Just as if I never sinned means that through justification by faith, we are accounted as though we are perfect. Amen. Even though we haven't even got started on that yet. Right? We're not perfect. But we're accounted as we're perfect. The word impute sounds a lot like it has the same root as compute. That's an accounting term. You know what the first computer was? Person. Well, you got me there. You're right. It was a person. Do you know what the second computer was? The first man-made computers were adding machines. And basically the only person in the world that used them were accountants. It is very much an accounting firm. That's what justification is all about. His righteousness is imputed to us. We are made the righteousness of God in Him. We're accounted as perfect even though we are sadly anything but. But the imparted righteousness we just read is never to stop. He changes us. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 18 talks about the glory when it says we are changed from image to image and from glory to glory into the same glorious image. That's the restoration of the character of God in us. But it's one 
habit at a time, one character trait at a time. Mm -hmm. That's how it happens. It's the work of a lifetime. We've all read, right? Yes. Our sins are reckoned with Christ. His righteousness is imputed to us. We are made the righteousness of God in Him. Because of His atoning sacrifice, our prayers go up to the Father laden with the fragrance of Christ's character. And one with Christ, we are accepted in the Beloved. That's the Father. Amen? Amen. Oh, how beautiful the language is. Brethren, if we will come to Christ by living faith, justification by faith, sanctification by faith, righteousness by faith. If we will come to Christ by living faith, the faith of Jesus, we may receive virtue from Him. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, and I'm very thankful for God's grace that is forgiveness. But it's not all forgiveness. Right? Sometimes when it says the word grace, and I think it's most of the time in the Bible in the spirit of prophecy, when it says the word grace, most of the time it's talking about God's power that he gives us to overcome. Amen. Amen. What does the word virtue mean? Power. We think of virtuous as being, being good, but look it up. Virtue is the power to be good. Thank God there is an abundant supply of grace in Him. You say, I believe. She says, how do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus saves you now? Do you believe that you can appropriate the merits of your Savior to yourself? That's why over and over she tells us that Jesus must be our personal Savior. Do you believe that Jesus saves you now? Do you believe that you can appropriate the merits of your Savior to yourself? Do you believe that you can cast your helpless soul upon Christ and that His righteousness will be imputed unto you? The last Bible verse I want to share with you. Is Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's not a lucky rabbit's foot. Jesus is not a lucky rabbit's foot. It's not if I call on the name of Jesus, I'm going to get something for it. That's not what's being said here. Not at all. There is not salvation in any other name. No other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. It's the name of Jesus that saves us. But it's not saying it. It's not even believing it. We have to have the relationship with Him. The character building relationship with Him. Because that's what He does. We, we've quoted it so many times. It has become my favorite Bible verse. It gets quoted by me. I can hardly preach a sermon without quoting it. I can hardly do a Sabbath school class without quoting it. Colossians 1.27 We've already said it several times here today. Christ in you, in me, the hope 
of glory. That Bible verse and this Bible verse are saying exactly the same thing. And if we don't see that, then we're not understanding one or the other. Okay, would you come? I just thought it would be nice to close out today by turning in our songbooks to number 340 and singing the great old song, Jesus Saves. Praise His name. Let us stand. We have heard a joyful sound. Jesus saved. Jesus.